As the world focuses on fighting off a virus, a new deadly threat is emerging. Lockdowns around the world have led to labor shortages, supply chain disruption, and a reduction in international trade. The result, less available food, and less money to pay for it. It's a deadly combination, and we've got to act now, and we've got to be smart, and we've got to thread the needle. You can't, you can't just deal with COVID by itself or hunger by itself. They must be dealt with together. If we do it right, we can save lives. If we don't do it right, people will die. The coronavirus and world hunger, how one crisis is fueling another. There are warnings the world is on the brink of a hunger pandemic. COVID-19 is threatening to push millions into starvation. Oxfam says combined with conflicts, inequality and a climate crisis, the pandemic has shaken a strained food system. The NGO says if we don't act now, up to 12,000 people could die per day from hunger linked to the crisis before the end of the year. The message from poor communities around the world, hunger may kill us before corona. Well, let's start by bringing in Rob Voss from the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. What's the world got to do to save these people from starvation? Um, good morning. First, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Um, two things, I would say. First is to keep food systems functioning amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the world has managed relatively well to keep uh, many supply chains functioning, but we've seen many dis disruptions as well, particularly in the provisioning of perishable foods like fruits, vegetables, dairy products, and the impact has been most severe in developing countries. And second is to give people more money in their pockets uh, so they can buy enough foods. Uh, we project that about 150 million more people could fall into poverty and uh, will not have enough money to buy the foods they need. So what are those countries that uh, uh, are facing uh, these problems the most doing to support those in need if it comes down to uh, a fall in incomes and, and people falling into poverty? Well, the most affected areas are, are those that already before COVID-19 suffering from hunger and uh, poverty. So we're talking about uh, many countries in Africa, particularly the Horn of Africa, but also in West Africa, uh, some parts of the Middle East like Yemen, uh, South Asia, uh, India. That's where the places where the strains will be uh, biggest. And also it's the areas where um, the threat of other plagues, uh, like the locust plague, is biggest. And particularly in Africa and the Middle East, it's also the parts where conflicts, war, and effects of climate change are hurting food systems the most. Are those governments there doing enough? Um, some are trying, but they have to make very hard choices between containing the pandemic, uh, protecting health, uh, while keeping food systems going. So in some cases, like in Nigeria, they've closed uh, local markets, uh, making it difficult for people to buy their food. Um, uh, overnight transportation has been prohibited because of curfews, and that's creating problems. Um, because of um, uh, food that's normally transported during the night is very perishable, is now transported during the day and gets uh, food losses. But some countries are doing, um, attempting with the help of international organizations to expand social protection programs, particularly cash transfer programs, and at least helping attenuate uh, some of the, the worst impacts of this crisis. What about the long-term impact of something like inadequate nutrition, especially for young children, something that's also a, a, a dire situation right now? Well, it, it all comes together. So um, we know that undernutrition at young age will haunt you the rest of your life. It uh, makes children less able to learn at school. Um, they're more prone to uh, becoming sick. Um, also, later in life, and also, uh, new research has shown that uh, younger people that were undernourished at young age uh, are more likely to become obese when they grow adults and then at risk of other types of diseases. So we don't address uh, their situation. Um, 
uh, COVID-19, but also undernourishment more in general, will haunt them the rest of their lives. Just in general, addressing this situation for governments, I mean, providing a proper social safety net, uh, would obviously avoid enormous humanitarian costs if this does turn into a global food crisis. Well, it's a short-term measure that certainly will help. Uh, we, we're doing it in, in Europe and to some extent also uh, in other rich countries. Um, but developing countries may not have the space. So um, social safety nets can expand. So it will bring immediate relief. But if we don't keep food systems uh, functioning at the same time, you should expect food prices to go up and then the social benefits will be worth less to buy enough food for people that uh, are most in need. Rob Voss from the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Well, it's plain hunger that's opened up a new front in the battle against poachers in South Africa. Poor towns, broken economies and the need for food has seen a surge in poaching under lockdown. On the hunt for poachers. Corona may have shut the borders in March, but the danger is still here. Frick Rousseau had hoped the lockdown would drive down demand for illegal hunting, and it did, but only briefly. Today, he finds a decayed rhino carcass. Never get used to the carnage. Um, you always feel bad when you, when you see this, especially now. That rhino numbers has decreased over the last couple of years, and you know that... that this is just one of not many left. Uh, that makes you sad. The carcass is already about eight days old. Traces of the poachers will be hard to find. Hotels and bush camps have been sitting empty since March. There are no tourists and hardly any traffic. That makes it easier for rangers to spot poachers. And that did keep them away at first but the danger is back. Unemployment and poverty are on the rise with the lockdown and desperation is setting in. The team is busier than ever. They search high and low for the poachers. This ranger asked to remain anonymous. We'll call him Trevor. Animals aren't the only ones at risk in his line of work. I recently had a run-in with poachers. They were carrying AK-47 rifles. Smaller animals like antelope are now also being targeted by poachers for their meat. They use crude methods, including barbed wire, to trap the animals. Hundreds have been found. It's a cat and mouse game in South Africa, where livelihoods have been ravaged by the virus. In the villages around the national park, surviving the pandemic financially is proving difficult. Trevor has experienced poverty firsthand growing up. His neighbor worked in a restaurant before the lockdown was imposed. It's closed now and she's unemployed. Most people are sitting at home wondering if they'll ever be able to return to work. Back to Ranger Rousseau, who finds a bullet a tiny piece of evidence left by the poachers. He worries about the park's future. Tourism is essential, he says, not only to fund the park's conservation, but also to give people back their livelihoods. It's that part of the show when you can ask our science correspondent whatever's on your mind when it comes to the coronavirus. Just send your questions to Derek on our YouTube channel. Assuming different COVID-19 vaccines are successful on different timelines, what is the possibility there will be multiple vaccines available within a certain country? The chances are, are quite high, actually. Um, there are over 150 different vaccine trials going on around the world, and, and over 30 of them are already in human trials, a few of them quite far advanced uh, down the road to approval. Um, they're also based on a number of, of different platform technologies, which will play a, a role in, in the crucial step of, of production when and if they're shown to be effective on a wide scale. Um, what are known as messenger RNA vaccines 
would be quite fast to produce, but, but the technology is still pretty cutting edge. It's so new that, that if an mRNA vaccine is approved for COVID-19, it would be the first mRNA vaccine to be approved ever for, for a disease. Um, more tried and tested technologies that rely on, on small or inactivated doses of a pathogen or, or proteins that it carries. They take longer to produce at scale, but also um, we have more experience with them, making them in some ways more likely candidates uh, for fast approval. I think down the road, um, there's almost certain to be overlap from, from different vaccines in different places.